The old growth forest in Seattle's Seward Park is a rare remnant of what was once one million acres of Puget Lowland Forest. These 120 acres of Douglas fir, red cedar, hemlock, and big leaf maple are a full 10% of all that remain of those million acres. They survive here on this peninsula, set smack dab in the middle of Seattle, a metropolitan area of four million people. This peninsula and its forests survived two onslaughts. As the last ice age ended 14,000 years ago, meltwater, cutting with a fire hose of force, ran south and west out to the Pacific, carving out all of our north-south lakes, bays, and the Puget Sound itself. A chance extrusion of bedrock right here deflected that rushing meltwater, turning it aside to the east and west. This bit of land, which the Salish Lake people called the place having fat nose, survived. A second onslaught came 170 years ago. White settler colonists arrived and the logging began straight away. Seattle's own forest was the first to be cut. But not here. In 1903, during an early burst of prosperity and civic pride, Seattle hired the Olmsteads, whose city design included the recommendation that this peninsula be set aside immediately for public use rather than being logged and developed. In the ensuing 120 years, this park and this forest has played an important role in the lives of many. We call it the Magnificent Forest. We call it Seattle's crown jewel. But all is not well. Acres of sword ferns began dying in 2013. The Western Hemlock, Washington's official state tree, is now dead or dying throughout the forest. Causes unknown. Both of these phenomena are seen elsewhere in the region, but nowhere so clearly, so dramatically, nor so conveniently studied as here at Seward. In the greenhouse study, um, all we had was some anecdotal evidence that there might be a pathogen causing the blight. Um, we could see in Seward Park that the die-off appeared to be spreading through the forest, but not affecting any of the co-occurring native plant species. Uh, so this was a good indicator that the blight was in fact caused by a pathogen um, because abiotic processes don't tend to travel through the forest in that manner. It suggests that drought stress is not the primary cause of the sword fern blight. So that made us think that there's some kind of a, an agent in the sap of the diseased ferns, which is kind of the way that these bacterial and viral uh, pathogens work. They are moved by an insect or something else, and, and they move in the sap of the plant. So what I'd like to see us do is uh, sample these uh, plants, maybe some fronds that are starting to show dieback symptoms and some healthy ones and do the, uh, the next generation sequencing where we extract DNA and sequence everything in that sample and see if there's any differences between the microbiome of the healthy fronds and the diseased fronds. I think that should be our next step. As far as doing the DNA sequencing, if there was funding, we could do that in our lab. Let's start with a a hypothesis and the hypothesis is that it is a pathogen and in any case the damn sword fern is dying. One of the most important opportunities they have is to pursue this question of what's causing the mortality of the sword fern. And the sword fern is a really really important understory species throughout the Douglas fir region and we need to know what's going on there. Uh, what factors are involved, whether or not a pathogen is involved. And if there is a pathogen involved, you know, how, uh, how we need to deal with that in order to avoid having it spread. So I think that's one of the very best opportunities for, uh, to do good both for the, the, the park itself and for the region as a whole. The sword fern is one of those that uh, I think has been here for so long and is so bountiful and plentiful that we kind of take it for granted. There's a, a message being conveyed by Mother Nature 
that something is wrong and out of balance and it needs to be corrected. This is the time when we as humans uh, acknowledge that uh, cry for help. It's time that the rest of us uh, hear that same request and, and come to the aid of, of Mother Nature and, and what she does here, all the good work that she does here. We've done some good work. Um, we have some preliminary results, but it's now time to move from uh, beer bottles to beakers and autoclaves. It's time to move from uh, tape measures and smartphones to uh, DNA sequencing and, and cytometry. It's important to move from enthusiastic uh, weekend uh, volunteers to professional scientists well trained in the field and able to bring everything they know and all of their, their expertise to the problem in a sustained way until it's figured out. That means that, that we now need serious sustained funding to support that work.